NZXT's new Kraken X63 claims to have the, quote, highest performing cold plate to date, something we'll put to thermal torture testing later in this review, and it markets itself as a brighter, more customizable version of the highly successful X62. The X62 has been one of NZXT's best products, so we wanted to check the X63 refresh to see if the company has kept up with its older designs. We've had six of NZXT's Kraken X62 coolers deployed on test benches since the coolers came out, and we haven't had any issues with any of them yet. We did have one X52 fail previously due to a pump failure, but overall the X62 has been a reliable product that has some of the most efficient noise to thermal performance we've ever tested on any cooler. The X63 is usable with NZXT's interminable cam software, which remains, well, the way it always has been, but is otherwise $10 cheaper than the X62 and theoretically improved. So we'll look at all of that today. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store, and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. We have a lot to go through today with the X63. We've done a ton of torture testing on it. We've done 40 dBA noise normalized testing to see how it does versus everything else at the same noise level because that shows us what the efficiency is. And the X62 was genuinely one of the most efficient coolers we've tested for noise to thermal performance. So it's worth revisiting with the X63. The 63 is, to its credit, called a refresh, so it's not branded as a new product, but it does have an Ace Attack 7th Gen pump in it. So we're going to do a teardown on the X63 to see if it is properly different inside than the X62 was, which was a Gen 5 Ace Attack cooling solution. Corsair seems to be basically the only company that's ever used the Gen 6, and it had a few small changes with it. Uh, externally, like the cold plate size was about 10% different, but overall, Gen 6 was mostly a, an improvement to the impeller, which moved from the plastic three-pronged yellow impeller that was in all of the old Ace Tech designs to a metal impeller that should be much more durable and resilient with age. So we need to see what the Gen 7 pump has inside of it, and we'll talk about that later in this review as well, but we'll have a separate full teardown on it too so that you can see uh, what my experience will be like taking it apart. So uh, key items of note, it's $150 instead of $160, so it's a bit cheaper. It still has the six-year warranty, which is genuinely huge for these products because there is definitely a more of a hesitation for people to buy liquid coolers, even closed loop, than air coolers. And there's a lot of reason for that. Overall, the failure rate of liquid coolers, closed loop that is, is pretty low. But when they fail, it's spectacular. So either you hear about it in media or if you experienced it, it probably affects you in a much more significant way than if a fan fails on an air cooler. And of course, you do have one additional point of failure, which would be the pump rather than just the fans. So they are uh, wise to bundle this with a six-year warranty. Now, in our experience, although we don't have a huge sample size, we have a much larger one than most people, uh, our X62s have been unfailing and we've had them on test benches that have been tortured for every CPU review you've seen for the last several years from us. So we know those have worked well, and we hope that this one follows suit because we're eventually going to need to replace them. As for that six-year number, Ace Attack, back when it was doing the Gen 4 and Gen 5 designs, officially expected permeation to start getting severe at about five years. Permeation is the process of the liquid slowly getting absorbed into the tubing and other materials of the cooler throughout the life of the cooler. You could refill it at that point. So five years is about the magic number where permeation might become a problem, but not always. It depends on the environment it's used in, in a literal sense. The uh, actual atmosphere and environment where you live will impact it. Things like humidity and uh, obviously the temperature of the product you're cooling as well. So that's all important to keep in mind for endurance. Thermal performance is the real question for today. Ace Attack's pump generations haven't been able to yield per performance gains for a couple of years now, and uh, they've instead shifted focus to permeation prevention, improving flow pathways, things like that. So we'll see if Gen 7's actually gotten better. But before we get into that, we're going to go through a build section, just like we do for our case reviews, where we'll talk about the actual build quality and the experience with cam for the NZXT X63. Yes, it's back. 
and then we'll talk about thermal performance in greater detail than you'll find most places with some uh, noise normalized testing and properly controlled test environments. Before getting to the extensive thermal and noise testing, here's the build features. First, as for differences versus the Kraken X62, what seemed like a new product at first is ultimately revealed to be more of a refresh. That's okay, because NDXE actually does say this is, quote, a refreshed Kraken X series on its product features page on the website. And it's extremely rare for a company to have the confidence to simply admit that it has improved the product without fully replacing every single part. Cabling has been updated, as has the pump plate. The pump plate is now rotatable with 12 positions that follow the clock, making it so that users can install the cooler in any position without unintentionally ending up with an upside down logo. We'd really like to see NDXT make this user serviceable though, just the pump cap, because over the years we've gotten a lot of emails from users following our teardowns asking how to replace the interior sticker with their own. Not many people take these things apart and it's not particularly fun. But the pump plate is one of the pieces that doesn't actually contain liquid, so this could be done at a factory level to be made swappable by the user. They could maybe even make 3D printable files available or sell accessory kits for it. The next step in customization would be to make it a simple detachable pump plate so that people could replace things. RGB LEDs are old and no one cares anymore, but this level of customization would help set the product apart if it had it and it doesn't. As for cables, NDXC has simplified its cabling down to a 10 pin connector and a micro USB connector from the previous mini USB. The 10 pin splits three wires to say to power, necessary for the pump power. Do not forget to plug this in, a lot of people do. Two wires for the pump tachometer and four wires for the RGB LEDs because that's the most important feature ever made. The micro USB connectors plug into USB 2.0 on the motherboard and it's needed to initialize the pump, configure the LEDs and the pump speed, and potentially update firmware. Keep an eye out though, if you're using a mini ITX board, you might not have USB 2 headers on the board or enough of them, but you could do it a different way like we've done in the past. You could run an internal uh, micro to external type A connector and plug it into the back of the board. That though is where we run into a problem. NZXE's CAMP, which we've covered numerous times as being problematic software that doesn't always work well, will automatically update firmware without prompting the user once you plug that cable in. We find this to be an offensive reach into user space, and we're strongly opposed to auto-updating firmware on any product. Firmware is one of the few things that can brick a product without much effort, but it's also something that changes the root performance of a product. In general, the rule for BIOS, vBIOS, or camera firmware even, is to leave it alone if it works and you're happy with it. Automatic updates are bad. From our perspective, of course, there's a risk that test data becomes invalid because pump behavior could change without us knowing. And there's no way to opt out of the update because it'll just start installing as soon as CAM launches. From the perspective of users, NZXT and plenty of other companies have demonstrated time and again that being a first adopter is often a bad idea. And forcing everyone to become a first adopter seems risky. There's also a chance that the user isn't in a position where firmware updates are safe. Like if they have a pending shutdown or are working on other projects without knowing something spinning in the background. Assuming every user is an idiot and forcing updates on them isn't the right way to do business, especially for an enthusiast oriented company. We wanna see this switch to a simple dialog prompt that says an update is available. Is it okay to apply? There's no harm in a remind me later button, but there can be harm in an automatic firmware update without a prompt. We have another problem on the software side too. It's currently ambiguous whether CAM successfully writes profiles to the pump firmware or not. It seems like some of our X62 coolers will reset themselves to default pump profiles when plugged in again, and when unplugging them, you lose the necessary logging data to determine whether the profile held. It's sort of like Schrodinger's profile in that way. We can't really trust whether the firmware retains the profiling when disconnected, but some users might not want the cable. Others might want to immediately uninstall CAM after configuring the product. Back to the cooler hardware, despite a new Asetek generation for which we'll show internals in the teardown, the rest of the external materials are about the same. The radiator has 17 tubes on both the X62 and X63 and is the same, although the barbs on the pump block are marginally different and similar to what we've seen on Gen 6 coolers. The cold plate on the pump is similar to the original, but more polished in a literal sense. NZXT says that the cold plate is, quote, the highest performing cold plate to date, highly optimized for Intel 11.5X. Obviously, that'll carry over to AM4 as well, but ultimately, we were unable to detect any performance differences in testing. More on that momentarily, though. 
NZXE and Ace Attack alike have moved away from the older designs with concentric reins on the cold plate, and those are pretty very old now, and instead toward a completely flush design for the cold plate, which has been in action since at least the X62, so that hasn't changed. One side note here that's kind of interesting, NZXT still defaults to an Intel mounting plate on the X63, despite the fact that AMD is outselling Intel massively in the enthusiast space. Again, our audience alone is about 93% AMD to 7% Intel sales at this point. So it doesn't particularly matter because they do include AMD hardware. We're curious whether that's just an old approach to things or something that hasn't been reconsidered or if it's a packaging consideration, but it might be worth changing that at some point. The exterior materials are all plastic on the X63. It's a matte black color now, as opposed to the metal wannabe coloring of the X62. The rotation of the pump plate does make the product feel cheap in the hand at first opening, and it sounds cheap when working with it. But that's a byproduct of moving plastic parts. Once it's assembled, these issues are minimized because you don't have to touch it again, but it doesn't feel expensive when you open it. The cable consolidation is a good move on the X63, and the pump plate is a step toward customization people have been asking for over the years. Time to get into the thermals, though. And before that, as always, if you need our detailed testing notes, you can check the review link in the description below, where we have some of the newer information on thermal testing and controls. For the basics, all the voltages are controlled, the ambient temperature is controlled, it's logged every single second. We take a delta T over ambient number, the ambient doesn't change more than plus or minus one degree throughout the test, and we also do noise normalized testing, which is useful for a like for like comparison. For thermal testing, we ran a few variants of the Kraken X62 and X63 to determine performance differences between the two. We'll start our thermal testing with only the X62 and X63 coolers, and then add comparatives. Note that we've completely retested a new in-box Kraken X62 to refresh our data set, so our previous data for the cooler has been updated and tested in the same environment as the brand new one. They were tested back to back, obviously with a cool down period between. We'll move on to comparative testing in the next chart though. Here's our crack and only chart. For the soak temperature, which is our weighted measurement analyzing the time to soak rapid temperature spikes, the Kraken X62 with the X63 fans and the Kraken X63 stock cooler performed equivalently. There is a 0.9 degree gap between them, and this is within our test variance and error. The measurements were 35 degrees and 35.97 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient, with idle at 7.3 and 6.6 .6 degrees over ambient. There is functionally no difference between the old design and the new design with regard to thermal performance, which isn't surprising. This was tested with the same fans in the same positions, so we're not talking about fan differences here. It's just isolating to the pump and the radiator. When isolated down to the new pump, because the radiator is the same, it would appear that not much has changed in Ace Attack's performance. That was true going from Gen 5 to Gen 6 as well, with marginal performance reductions on Gen 6 in exchange for improved permeation resistance and overall endurance of the pump and impeller. With the original X62 fans, which averaged about 20 to 30 RPM lower than our X63 fans, performance measured 36.2 degrees Celsius over ambient. Not much different even with those fans. The 40 dBA results between the two coolers only using identical fans as demarcated by the X63F nomenclature has them scoring again roughly equally. They're both at about 37 degrees, the X63 ran 36.95 over ambient, and the X62 using the X63 fans ran at 37.5 degrees Celsius over ambient. The internal differences might be beneficial somewhere, but it's not thermal performance. For the steady state torture workload with Krakens only at maximum power consumption of the chip as we test it, we end up again with results within test variance or error. The 40 dBA results are both at about 40 degrees over ambient with idle at 7, and the full speed tests in all variations fall within a 1 degree range, eliminating any meaningful difference with regard to performance. Ace Attack uses a silkscreen method to pre-apply paste to NZXT's coolers at the factory. We actually have their same silkscreen paste applicators here, and we have an old video about how we use them sometimes to control certain types of testing with perfect thermal paste application. These days, though, we do a manual spread because, well, we're trying to equalize everything for the chip size. As far as Ace Attack, though, the downside to Ace Attack's approach is that the smaller circular paste application doesn't fully cover larger IHS processors. The upside is that it's normally good enough or insignificantly different for standard desktop processors when testing like for like with the same paste. We've found a few products over the years where there is a meaningful difference and it has mattered and we would recommend applying your own paste. 
But we happen to have the exact paste that ASATEC and .dxt use here. So we did a like for like test between them. For this one, we were only able to observe differences within a few tenths of a degree from each other. Multiple retests establish that this is a pattern and a repeatable result, but it's not a meaningful difference. In this instance, the paste application is fine for something like modern Intel HEDT, although we would still strongly advise considering a better spread of paste for higher power consumption, especially if you're going to use a better paste than stock anyway. Here we used the same for comparison. AMD Threadripper parts obviously shouldn't be used with these coolers ever due to the cold plate sizing mismatch, but AMD Ryzen parts would be fine with stock application. We'd still recommend considering something manually done though. Just clean it off first. You don't want to be like The Verge. You could do better with a significantly better paste, but with regard to coverage area, it's actually good enough. Our next chart shows comparative data with all coolers set to 40 dBA at 20 inches, which allows us to eliminate the brute force cooling methods and instead control for cooler efficiency at the same noise level. It's not fair otherwise. Simply testing at maximum fan speeds out of box or picking a random percentage speed as some people do doesn't really tell us anything about which cooler is best. All it does is tell us who has the faster fans, since those units will typically chart top in a test anyway. We do have that data later for those who really want it, but note that we recently refactored our data and retested or re-averaged coolers after tuning our accuracy and improving a few testing practices. So some data has been updated recently. In the SOAK test for comparative data, the X63 and X62 remain some of the most efficient coolers in our chart. They're barely outmatched by the H360 X3 and the EVGA CLC360, both 360 mil coolers but the X63 is technically within variants of the H360X3. The H150i is functionally equivalent to the X63 once noise normalized. The EVGA CLC outdoes it here and also has more cooling headroom if willing to endure the 60 dBA noise levels at a 20 inch distance that it creates, which is maybe useful for enthusiast overclocking sessions or for flight simulators where you want a jet engine next to your head. The X62 and X63 are both about equally efficient and have good overall scoring. Looking at our newly refactored torture test at 40 dBA, where we take only the steady state maximum load number and ignore CLC soaking abilities, the X63 and 62 place about equally to the H115 IV2, the Celsius 360, and the H360 X3. There's not a huge difference between most of these and thermals. Looking now at torture results with a few speeds listed for various coolers, but primarily focused on full speeds, the X63 demonstrates that it about matches the H100 IV2 to 40 mil CLC when running a significantly louder 2500 RPM. It's also close to the H150i at 1600 RPM, both in the 35 to 36 degree range. The EVGA CLC360 still tops the chart, but is also unbearably loud at its performance. As for the noise resultant of that temperature, the Kraken X63 at full speeds runs at about 49.1 dBA at 20 inches. We'd recommend running a custom fan profile or fixed lower speed, as marginal speed reductions can greatly reduce noise while minimally reducing thermal performance. NZXT did claim that its new cooler was 2.5 dBA quieter than its predecessor, and as it turns out, that's about right. We tested the two at a gap of 51.5 to 49.1 dBA. One note, we did hear a lot of pump noise and trickling at first boot. This was honestly pretty troubling at first. It was loud. I could hear it from the entrance of the room and the test bench was about 12 feet away and distance between me and the bench was another two benches running a CPU tests. So it was a problem. That said, after about an hour of running, the air bubbles seemed to have sorted themselves out and relocated elsewhere, likely the top of the tank, which is exactly why you should always mount CLCs with the tubes down, not up, as is often shown erroneously in promotional photos by the very companies who sell these components, despite the recommendation to install them pumped down. The pump noise is noticeable and louder than the fans at first, but in our unit, it subsided with the air pocket relocation later on. We did not hear any noticeable pump whine on our unit, and the pump trickling did go away entirely or was at least obscured by the fan noise. So that doesn't mean it doesn't happen on others, but it went away on ours. But overall, for the X63, basically, it's a pretty simple conclusion. If you were going to buy the X62, or if you liked the X62, or if you have one and you want to replace it with the same product, although we can't speak to the endurance yet because it is a new generation of Asetek pump, and we haven't... We haven't actually tested it yet for a long term because it's not been out that long. Uh, if you want to replace or buy another X62, this seems to be basically an equivalent. It is the same in performance. It's mostly the same in looks slightly different. It's mostly the same in external or exterior build materials. So it's all pretty much the same. 
which means it's not super exciting, but if you wanted one, uh, there's really no difference between this and an X62 in terms of thermal performance. They are the same. A bit quieter on the X63 to give NZXT credit for that. Some of that's the pump and the, the fans combined. Uh, also, there's a bit of a difference, obviously, from fan to fan. One unit to the next will have a 10% range, so uh, that impacts things for noise testing too. But overall, there's really, there's really no meaningful difference from our standpoint, X62 versus 3, and our standpoint is performance oriented. So how we look at this, and I was speaking with Patrick, who does a lot of our CPU benching the other day, how we look at it is, well, when our X62s start to get too old to trust, or uh, maybe if they start to fail, or we just want to replace them because we need to keep stuff fresh for testing purposes, we'll probably replace them with these X63s. So we're fine with it. We haven't really seen any reason not to be as of yet. And any endurance concerns will obviously have to be uprooted through longer term testing. We never ran into endurance concerns with X62s. So Gen 7 might be different, but we don't really have much reason presently to suspect that there would be a difference. We'll see though. So uh, should you buy it? Well, if you really like the look, obviously go for it. It has, there's, there's really no problem with it uh, that we've run into in a major hardware way. The software we don't like still, but for LEDs, if that's what you care about, it works. And uh, if you don't really care about any of this LED stuff, but you just want efficient performance for noise levels, it's still one of the most efficient coolers. Some of the 360s will be better, but they're bigger and they might not fit. Obviously, air coolers are always an option. And we've been talking about those a lot lately. We've had three or four videos in the last couple of weeks on them. We're working on more and we're just sort of slowly ramping that content and building on it. So stay tuned for more air cooler discussion. But as far as liquid coolers go, just strictly with CLCs, the X63 remains one of the most efficient in terms of noise and thermal performance designs on the market. And so overall job well done on DXT, but please, please, please fix cam and stop auto updating firmware. That's terrible. So other than that, it's all good. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get bonus behind the scenes videos or go to store.gamersnexus.net. We'll see you all next time.